I think they're also not just stylish on the pitch, but stylish off it as well with the suavest manager in the European Championships, Roberto Mancini. He doesn't really feel like a proper number nine. He's maybe a, a little bit in the Harry Kane mold. To match or surpass what they did in Euro 2016, where they overachieved, really, considering the talent in the squad. They're the best coached team under Antonio Conte. Unlucky to go out in a penalty shootout to Germany. Remember those awful spot kicks from Graziano Pele and also Simone Zaza. So I think they want to get into the last eight of the competition again, see what happens, and then point um, to the World Cup in Qatar, which I think they want to be one of the contenders for. Well, there's a few. I think more recently in 2012, you look at the incredible Hulk celebration performance, those goals Mario Balotelli scored uh, for Italy against Germany and the promise of his talent uh, at that time. Uh, but for me, you have to go back to Euro 2000 uh, when Italy also reached the final, uh, the semi-final against uh, the Netherlands where they went down to 10 men after half an hour and you know managed to hang in there, uh, take it to a, a penalty shootout and Totti again go back to a, a Penenko or Cucchiaio. And all his teammates could believe him when he said he was going to do that. Uh, he was going to chip Edwin van der Sar, but chip him he did. And uh, yeah, that was just one of the most unforgettable moments that the Azuri have ever had at this tournament. No one sings the national anthem quite like the Italian national team. It'll be a shame that Gigi Buffon uh, won't be there because he belts it out like no other. And this has become a real trademark of the Azzurri. I think they're also not just stylish on the pitch, but stylish off it as well with the suavest manager in the European Championships, Roberto Mancini. Well, I'm going to fudge this and say the midfield um, because this is how Roberto Mancini has rebuilt the national team. Uh, it's really important from a stylistic and philosophical uh, point of view as well. Jorginho is the player who's made the most appearances under Mancini um, and yeah, he didn't feature enough under Mancini's predecessor, Gian Piero Ventura. Marco Verratti as well has had a great season with Paris Saint-Germain. Uh, he's got injured though, so they're sweating on his fitness. Uh, and then Nicola Barella, who uh, it was one of the fresh faces on the Mancini and immediately established himself in the team and has just uh, improved exponentially over the last year under Antonio Conte. You just have to go and look at that back heel assist he laid on for Lautaro Martinez against Real Madrid in the Champions League. It's a contradiction because Italy have got uh, prolific strikers. You know, Chiro Immobile has won the golden shoe. He beat Robert Lewandowski to that honour last season. He's had four consecutive years with 20 or more goals. You've got Andrea Bellotti as well at Torino. He's had, what, six consecutive years in double figures. And the question is, can these guys translate that on the international stage? They have started to do that, but this has been one of the main question marks throughout Mancini's time. Do they have a reliable goal scorer? Immobile stepped it up in the Champions League, but we need to see it at a European Championship. And Chiro Immobile, just because he seemingly always scores a ton of goals, but also pads his stats with a bunch of penalties as well. But um, this season, 0.52 non-penalty goals per 90 is, you know, that's good for a goal every other game. And, and you take that at uh, kind of any level of football. But um, yeah, whether we, we see him have exactly the same role as he does at Lazio, the national team. I mean, he's someone who can create and score. He gets in the box, gets in the ball in the box a ton. Um, seven touches per 90 is really up there in, in Serie A in terms of compared to other forwards. So I quite like him. He, he doesn't really feel like a proper number nine. He's maybe a, a little bit in the Harry Kane mold where he's kind of playing that nine and a half. Also, you know, a mixture from the nine and the 10 role. So um, yeah, Immobile for me is a, an interesting one. I'm going to go with Alessandro Bastoni, um, the centre-back. Uh, even though Italian football is not as defensive as it once was, it still produces uh, great defenders. Uh, Bastoni came through at Atalanta, got a very big move very early, 
um, to Inter has become one of the linchpins in Antonio Conte's Scudetto winning side. Comfortable playing in a back three, uh, even though Italy don't really play that. There'll certainly be competition for places with Chiellini probably going to his last uh, major tournament. Um, but Bastoni might uh, be a candidate um, to start if he can dislodge um, the partnership that we really saw through much of qualifying, which was uh, Bonucci and Francesco Cied. I think Manu Locatelli uh, is the main option, really, just 23 years old and a very assured passer on the ball. Um, great passing range, someone who's fantastic at progressing the ball upfield, but also can keep it simple, can pass under pressure. Um, you really see him a bit in, I guess, the, the Jorginho mould, maybe the Tony Gross mould, but someone who can just really set the tempo in midfield uh, and he's a good focal point for the rest of the team. Well, when Italy last reached the European Championship final in 2012, uh, they did so knocking out England. Remember that iconic uh, Pirlo Penenko Cucchiaio, as they call it in Italy. That's what Totti famously named it, over Joe Hart. Um, so I think if they were to face England, there would be respect. But remember, Italy have really kind of played up under Mancini how many times they've won the World Cup significantly more than, than England. There is a reverence, of course, for everything that the Premier League has done. And a couple of teams that have reached the Champions League final, City and Chelsea. Foden attracted a lot of attention uh, for his part in City's run um, to the final, particularly with Fabio Capello being a pundit. Uh, Capello, who was England manager, always talks up the Premier League. Mancini, obviously coached there, always talks up the Premier League. So there's a lot of respect, even though history and tradition I would say, would uh, still see Italy thinking that they can maybe get the edge on England if they were to come acro across each other in this tournament. Hello, I'm David Ornstein, and I'm here to tell you what The Athletic has planned across its podcast network during the Euros. You can catch me alongside Mark Chapman and a range of other athletic writers on The England Show throughout the tournament, bringing you the very latest news and insight from the England camp every single day. Prior to the big kickoff, we're releasing an eight-part documentary series telling the stories of the past eight tournaments, starting with the sounds and smells of Euro 88 and finishing in 2016. There'll also be nightly episodes of The Totally Football Show, nine zonal marking podcasts from Michael Cox's tactics and analytics team, and Adam Hurry's football cliches. We'll take a look at the competition's alternative storylines. So, with what felt like a never-ending domestic season finally behind us, we've got all of your Euro 2020 needs covered. Check out every show for free wherever you get your podcasts.